everyone. I'm going to do a demo in Julia. To continue off where we left off, we did a pretty basic optimization last time. So we're going to add a, a few new challenges uh, this go around. As an outline, uh, some of you have noticed that you may want to pass additional parameters to your analysis beyond just X. So we should show you how to do that. Um, many times our objective and constraints are actually contained in one function. This is pretty common in many engineering analyses where uh, you know, these, these outputs of interest have many common calculations. And so it's hard to really separate them. We actually won't be able to fully address this while well, we could, but I'm not gonna fully address this today. We'll see in a second. We'll discuss a little bit about post-processing and, and also look at some additional options. Okay, so let's go back to where we were last time. This is, I'm just gonna copy and paste this. This is what we did last time. Um, we uh, optimized with IP opt and I'm actually gonna explicitly import here just to be a little more clear, just a little better practice. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're, we're importing this model and this is the solver we're using. We had a simple objective. We had two constraints uh, here uh, written in this array, a starting point, and then we ran the optimization and got the outputs out. Okay, so I actually have the exact same objective and constraints this time. Let's see if I can go grab this without the toolbar getting in the way. Okay, so this is the exact same objective and constraints. I just wrote them, or wrote them as if this was, uh, let's say some truss or some structural analysis where um, I was trying to minimize mass and I had some constraints on stress. And this could be some really long thing uh, obviously, uh, but just, just to give you an example where I have multiple inputs, multiple outputs, not just my objective uh, um, and constraints necessarily, and not just my design variables. In this case, this actually is fairly separable, but often it's not. So for example, if I was uh, had a constraint on drag, or sorry, a, a, an objective of minimizing drag for my airplane and a constraint on the lift, all of those are gonna come from the pressure. So there'll be a lot of calculations that'll be very common. It's only really the last step where we uh, integrate in different, um, or take different components of the, the force vector that we could separate those. And so uh, separating objective and constraints becomes uh, unnatural or, or just not really possible except for maybe a, a final step. And if that computation is expensive, we'd like to reuse a lot of that. So that's one of the things we're gonna look at, but First, <clears throat> let's look at uh, this case here. So we've got this extra parameter. And so our objective now is really uh, structure. So I'm gonna just erase this and we'll just call this our objective. Yeah, we can leave it my objective, my constraint, that's fine. Actually, I'm just gonna call it shorter. Okay, so if I had a function, I'll get rid of that, a function objective it needs to have this kind of signature, right? It just takes an X, but I need structure to take X and params. And params, notice these are just some variables I put in here. So um, easiest way to do this is with a closure. So we could define parameters. In this case, they are, this corresponds to this problem. And so this is actually this 100 and this three, same problem we did last time. Let's put them in this vector here. Uh, and then I can have a, a nested function. We can actually do this in one line, but I'll do it this way. Call structure with X and params and params will be taken from the outer scope. And, and more typically we'd wanna probably put this all into a function and maybe params just becomes an input to that function. So, and then maybe we run the whole optimization in that function. So now when I run optimization, for example, I can try different sets of parameters. But you can see here what we've done is that parameters coming in, I have a nested function. And so this is available from that outer scope. So parameters is passed in that way. And then X is getting changed every time through the optimizer um, for this fixed set of parameters. Okay, so I, I can deal with that. I've got mass and stress. And let's say I define my constraints. Um, here, my objective is just gonna be the mass. I just wanna minimize the mass. For my constraint, I could do the same kind of thing here. Uh, and then my constraint is gonna be, that I want my stress to be less than some maximum stress. And I could also put that as an input here if I wanted to, I'll do it that way. And if I go back, it's, it's these two values that I'm using here. So one and five, 
doesn't matter if it's a semicolon or not here. Okay, stress max. Great, so I could do that. Um, the downside of this, as we were just discussing, is that let's say this is an expensive analysis. It's very often in, during the course of the optimization that I'm gonna want to evaluate my objective and my constraints at the same set of X values. So when I call it here and I get mass and stress, I return mass, but stress just gets thrown away. And then maybe right after I call this again, uh, and then I get stress, but I threw mass away and I already had stress at that same X. So it's a bit of a waste. I'd like to avoid that if possible. Um, and different optimizers will call these in different orders. Actually for IP opt, when we're using it, it calls the constraint first. But in general, if we didn't know we could do this, we could say, uh, we could do it on both. We could say if, um, if X is equal to our last value of X, uh, so, so here's what we're gonna do just to set it up. We're gonna cache our, our objective and constraints. And if it changes, um, uh, so, so if the x value is a new one, then we'll reevaluate our function. And if it's not, if it's equal to the last value, we'll just pull that cached value or cached value out. So, what I'd really like, ideally, I wish the optimizer would take it in this form: the objective and constraints together. Um, and so that, that that makes it easier, right? Because if they're together anyway, that's easier. And if they were separate, then it's not hard to just call them both in this function. Um, but then if I did that, I could take both of these things here, right? Um, and I could do this, let's say my objective is mass, my constraint is this, and I can return them both. Okay, so ideally I only want to define this in one place and I'd like to write these objective and constraint functions so they work generically. So for example, I can call this objcon function here and just get that and return the F. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna save our last value for X um, and I need some X naught. So I'm gonna just say, just to initialize it, I'm just gonna say it's two times X naught. So I'm gonna set up X naught here, for example. I could pass it in here too, but I'll just set it up here. Let's just say it's three, four for this problem, some chosen value. I'm gonna save X last. I'm gonna save my last objective function. I'm just initializing it here. And this is gonna be um, however many constraints we have. In this case, we only have two constraints. Okay, so I initialize them. So what I'm gonna do again is if, if I'm gonna record my last X value, if, it has, if, it's, uh, if it's new, then I better evaluate again. If it's not, then I can just return the last one. So I'm just gonna return the last one if nothing changes. So I'm gonna see if X is equal to my last value. If it's not, I have to reevaluate everything and I'm gonna update these values. And then I set uh, X last to be X and then I end. So again, what happens here, I come in, if these two are equal, then I skip this whole thing and I just return the last function value that I already had. If, they, um, if they're not equal, then I better update my function value and my constraint. And then I save, this is now the last X value I, I used. So I could do basically the exact same thing here in my constraint function return those constraints and that's all. And in general, that would work most of the time. Okay, so there's a subtlety here. I actually don't wanna to dive too much into right now, but this is not gonna quite work without some extra work. Um, we're using a, a model that provides derivatives for us automatically using algorithmic differentiation, something we'll talk about a little later. This is very nice. This is actually a, a really big plus compared to um, the other optimizers I showed in the MATLAB and Python videos, if you looked at those, those are just finally differencing. But a challenge there is that um, the way this is done, uh, we use uh, another type, instead of a floating point, we're using this dual number type. And what will happen is uh, because I'm using a value, well, I don't wanna to get too much into the details here. I'll just say that we can address this, um, but the ideal way to address this is actually not just to provide the function, the constraint, but to provide the derivatives also, because those are also not, uh, we don't wanna reevaluate those um, because X is going to be um, the same location generally for all of those calls at once, the objective, the constraint, the derivatives of the objective and the derivatives of the constraint, right? In other words, that gradient and that Jacobian. So I really wanna cache all four of those. 
but that's going to be a, a little more work. We'll show, I'll show that a little bit later, but we haven't really talked about derivatives too much in class yet, so I don't want to uh, get too complicated yet. So for now, I just wanted to show you this idea because we'll see it again later. We're going to do the sort of lame, uh, less efficient thing, and just we're just going to have to call it both times, right? So it's just going to be a little, it's going to be twice as inefficient here because we have to call it twice, but it should work. So actually, let's just try that. Let's just run this. Let's see if I didn't make any typos or anything. Just give it a second for Julia to start up here. Probably should have started before. Video is in the way. Is it going? Oh. There we go. Structure not defined. OK, yeah. So structure is in another file here, so I need to pull it in. So I'm just going to include that file. Looks like I ran it twice on accident. OK, there we go. So I uh, ran, solved, optimal solution found. This is the right answer. OK, so that's good. All right, so we addressed a couple of these points. Talked about parameters. That was pretty straightforward. Talked about this, but not in the most satisfying way. Like I said, we'll address this a bit later. Um, let's look at some of the options and things. So we set um, starting points. We generally should have upper and lower bounds. Uh, that's good practice generally to use them. Not all the time, but it's usually good because it'll at least provide some help to the optimizer. You don't want it to artificially constrain things. So for example, the solution here, I, I didn't save these, did I X got to return them? So let's return, let's return the optimal X and F and then pull that out at the end here. Oops. Okay, yeah, so my optimal X is both less than one. So if I had put an upper bound of say 0 0.5, I would have artificially constrained the problem. In this case, these are these are far enough away that this is fine. Um, but it also prevents the optimizer from going, you know, too far out if that were to occur. Uh, it'll be easiest later. Actually, we're going to use a different interface. We're going to work with IPOP directly. It'll be a little easier to handle the, the case I was talking about with managing the, the um, gradients and the Jacobians. Allow us to do a little more. But um, in this case, to look at, uh, we're still using this model here. So I'm going to look it up. I don't actually remember the syntax. We're setting bounds here. Um, so we got our models. Yeah, okay, so right there after x naught and before the constraint function. So we could put the lower bound and then upper bound, right? Yeah, lower var upper variable. So you can see those are bounds on x. Great, so you can run it again. Everything is good. So if you notice, if I put a smaller value, for example, it's just going to hit those bounds, or at least I hit one of them here. So I've artificially constrained the problem. It is an optimal solution in the sense that this is what I actually meant, but one should be careful when you set bounds. If they're real bounds, right, then that's fine if it hit the boundary. But if it was just, uh, you know, providing some sort of guidance on things to not get too far, then um, then you want to make sure it's not artificially constraining. Okay, so uh, as far as processing goes, we actually can see a lot of output by default. The default option has a lot of print, and that's good because most of the time, I'm just putting in a sleep statement here, so this is slower. Most of the time when I'm running engineering analyses, they're more computationally expensive. These things can take a while. And so it's nice to be able to track the progress. You don't want to have the case where you just run it and you see nothing. Um, but being able to monitor these things and see what's going on, I can see, okay, here's the objective. Watch how it progresses. Um, and I can see it was making progress. You can see we started here pretty high. This is at about two and a half thousand. Uh, it's still about the same. Now I'm down to 610, down to 146. So it's it's making good progress. I can see my this is my infeasibility. It started out at 24. That was just the max the magnitude max magnitude of that um, that constraint vector. And now you can see it's actually feasible. The objective's going down. So this is making good progress. So Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill this because I don't want to sit there and watch it. Take out that sleep statement, but that's a, a good thing to do to be able to monitor um, progress. 
So let's go back over the browser and uh, look at options for IP opt. There are actually a ton. In fact, as they say here, maybe too many options. Um, this is actually not the main optimizer I use. I use SNOP primarily, so I'm less familiar with these, but let's just go through real quick and see if I can highlight a few that are uh, maybe important. Print level, as I said, it's 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 a default is pretty good. Um, but one thing that is useful here is this, uh, or maybe it may be useful to many of you is this output file. It's very helpful to, um, if you're doing lots of optimizations, say, especially you're running them on a, on a supercomputer or something, and you want to you know, go back and look at the history of these things, it can be nice to save them. But even if you're just running one at a time, often we run you know, a series of optimizations with different parameter sets and it can be helpful to go back and look at these output files, make sure everything converged well. And especially if you wanna convert, compare convergence histories and things, maybe you're trying different techniques. Many reasons why it might be nice to have an output file. Um, these are a lot more printing things. Tolerances, so here's the default tolerance. It's one e to the minus eight. Um, this is this, uh, let's see right here. This error, it's a relative scaled tolerance, but that may be something you need to adjust a bit. Uh, that may be too tight of a tolerance sometimes. Maximum number of iterations, sometimes you may hit that bound and want to make that a little bit bigger. Uh, max CPU time can be helpful. Say you wanted to, uh, you wanted this to be done when you came back, you know, overnight. You know, regardless, you, or whether you got to an optimum or not, you just wanted to to stop, and that would be good enough for you. Then, yeah, you, know, you could put something like that. Um, constraints, or sorry, tolerances on the constraint violation. Those often are usually uh, not as hard to satisfy. I don't usually need to change those as often. Um, scaling. That's something we've started talking about a bit, and we'll talk about more through the semester. Usually do this myself. I, I haven't really played to see how their scaling looks here, but it's something it's not too hard to do on your own, and uh, we'll talk about that quite a bit. Um, let's see. Let me expand this here. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of things here. Uh, there's some things on the bounds. Um, initialization. Okay, so one good thing to look at later is this derivative tests are, are very helpful when you're providing derivatives. It's a good idea to always check them first. Uh, that can be a common cause of problems. And so uh, most of these optimizers will have a built-in test. It's just gonna do a quick finite difference just to make sure everything looks reasonable. It can be very easy to you know, make a, a, an error, especially if you're providing an analytic derivative, maybe you missed a sign or a, a coefficient or something. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is good for now. We'll talk about some of these later. Warm starts are also kind of nice. Sometimes, you know, if you stopped an optimization, you wanted to continue it, you could warm start from a previous solution. Okay, so last thing I want to talk about is um, post processing. And actually, this is going to be easier next time too. When we look at the we work more directly with IP op, there's a callback function we can use. But here we're going to do our own, and it's going to be. Uh, slightly complicated by the fact that, um, oh, we'll see. So uh, here's how we would normally do this if you wanna do your own. We could just, um, we already have this nested vector or this nested function structure so we can initialize, for example, oops, this is my objective vector, let's say. We could, uh, we could initialize an array. What I wanna do is I just wanna keep track of my objective through the course of the optimization. Basically this column here, but I wanna just, save it in an array and then plot it. And maybe I could learn to compute other things. Again, this callback function would be more useful because we can access some internals of the optimization. But for now, we're gonna do this kind of quick and easy way. And if I have that vector, every time this function is called, I just want to um, append to it. I'm just gonna do something simple here and just say, let's, let's save that to the end of my array. And so every time this is called, I'm just adding my function value to the end and I'm gonna plot this so I can just see how this uh, progressed, for example. Um, and then I'm gonna return it. Okay, and then I could plot that. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'm misspelling here. Um, there's also another small issue. Again, this is related to these uh, algorithmic differentiation we're using. 
this is going to cause these dual numbers and they're going to not uh, be happy in this form. So here's what I'm going to do. Again, this is just temporary. You don't have to really worry about these details here too much. This, the, this idea that I showed is the main idea that, that will work in general. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a different function um, where if this is a, if these are float values, so not dual types, then I want this one to be called. So uh, what I'm going to do, so I don't have to retype it, I'm going to have this common function. It's going to do all these things. It's going to return f and g. Oops. And so in my normal function, this is the one that's going to get called when it's trying to get the derivatives. Uh, I'm just going to call a common. That's it. In fact, I could just let's just make it really shorter because it just doesn't do much. Um, but then my version, uh, when I have just floats and not anything else like dual numbers, I want to do common. Then I'm going to append that vector and then return it. So again, don't worry too much about that. The main idea is what we showed before. This is just a subtlety because these derivatives, and this won't be necessary later. We'll, we'll, we'll make this a bit cleaner later. So apologize that it's a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, out of the ordinary right now. Okay, so that was great. Um, there are a lot of different plotting packages. Uh, probably you should use plots. That seems to be the most popular, but I just, I used Python for so many years before switching to Julia that I just, I'm used to PyPlot, so I'll use that. Okay, so I'm gonna plot my objective vector on a semi-log plot here. It's just gonna be versus the iteration. Um, and let's open up that figure. There it is. So you can see it uh, start out pretty high, made good progress, and then slowly kind of converge toward um, towards a minimum. Uh, as I said later, we'll we'll have better plots where we can look at say uh, some first order optimality conditions. But this will just be something to get us started. Okay. So let's see. I think that's all we we're going to talk about. Yeah. So that's it for now. So next time um, we'll get a little more advanced and dealing with these um, uh, derivatives and probably I can I'll put together a template or something for you to make this a, a little more manageable but hopefully that gives you some a uh, little more to get to get going on all right see you later